Hello everyone, thank you for joining us for our final webinar for 2019. Can you believe it's all over? Another year of webinars done and dusted. Tonight's session, Casting the Net, Getting Your Content onto Multiple Platforms. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land from which we're broadcasting, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, paying respects to Elders past, present and emerging, and invite you all uh, to also acknowledge the traditional owners of the land from which you're joining us. You can do so in the chat box, or just sort of kindly remind that to yourself. That screen there at the moment, now live, the CBAA National Features and Documentary Series for 2019. Now available to listen online uh, is uh, the 2019 CBAA National Features Documentary Series, an on annual showcase of new work by Australian community radio producers. Uh, with training and mentoring provided by the Community Media Training Organisation, eight producers based at community stations coast to coast, city to bush, turned their idea into an original half hour feature for a national audience throughout 2019. Throughout these eight new features, you can hear community stories of cultural legacy, indigenous voices on drought and water management, a women's place in a traditional country association, descriptors of Australia's stunning landscape from ocean to the desert, first-hand accounts of life with a disability, and so much more. Uh, the 2019 documentaries are available free for airplay on Australian community broadcasters. Just go to the CBAA website, follow the links. That's the CBAA National and Features and Documentary Series. Thanks to our friends at the uh, Community Media Training Organisation, as well as the Department of Communication and Arts. And of course, the Community Broadcasting Foundation, whose funding helped us realise this dream. It's an absolutely wonderful initiative, the National Features and Documentary Series. And if you're looking for a bit of content to fill out the gaps throughout the festive season break over Christmas, Look no further than the NFDS, some really great content there. Uh, my name is Danny. I'm from the Community Broadcasting Association of Australia. Tonight's webinar, Casting the Net, Getting Your Content Onto Multiple Platforms. Our commitment to accessibility translates to an obligation for community broadcasting to be anywhere and everywhere our audience is listening. Uh, it's no surprise that more and more listeners are going online to access their audio. So it behooves us as community broadcasters to be there, to join them. Tonight's session, presented by Andrew Morris, CBAA Manager of Online Products and Services. Um, so great to have Andrew here. He's uh, come to the CBAA in the newly created role of Manager of Online Products and Services. 24 years of experience in the Australian radio industry, which by my reckoning mean, means that Andrew would have started doing radio when he was seven. Uh, he's committed uh, to the CBAA to ensure community media in Australia is positioned well to take advantage of the disruptive forces impacting our media listening habits. I'll let Andrew talk a bit more about himself, but it's absolutely wonderful to have him here uh, doing this session. In the session, we're going to look at trends in listening and how our audience consumes audio, how smart speakers can take our service to a wider audience, the benefits of iHeartRadio for community broadcasters, all that and so much more. Uh, Andrew, I am going to pass it over to you. I believe you are going to get on the microphone and the video as well as taking over everything that we have here. Do you read me? Are you ready to take over? I am, Danny. Thank you. Yeah, I was eight years old when I started in radio. I knew I'd get that figure wrong. All right. Thank you for... Uh, now, I'm going to try and share my screen here, Danny. Um, thanks for joining us tonight. Excellent, here we go, we're getting close here. Um, I'll just share my screen and we'll be on our way. And feel free to share your video as well if you'd like to uh, grace us with that. Andrew, any problems, send us a message, mate. I'll be right over yep. there. Okay, here we go. Sorry. Okay. Right, we're done. Awesome. Let's get this show on the road. Thanks for joining us for the final webinar for 2019. I'm Andrew Morris, as Danny said. And tonight, we're going to take a look at smart speakers and online streaming. And uh, I thought, first of all, we'll start off with the big picture uh, in terms of online listening. We'll take it down to uh, listening habits, traditional radio, AM, FM, and DAB is still king. 
We'll, we'll take it down and look at what else is happening in terms of Australian listening habits. We'll take a look at the big music streaming services, who's dominating at the moment. And then in terms of uh, streaming services, how's radio doing? And what are the big radio aggregators? And of course, we'll talk about iHeartRadio uh, during this presentation. And uh, going from that, we'll look at smart speakers and the importance of smart speakers, their growth over the last few years and exactly what they are and what you can do with the smart speaker. And also, because we, we are talking about distributing your audio uh, across uh, online platforms, we'll take a look at podcasting aggregation as well and take a look at, apart from Apple, Apple Podcasts, where else could you put your, uh, your podcasts in 2019 and beyond? And you might be surprised that YouTube is uh, a platform that is growing in a lot of popularity with uh, some of the biggest podcasters around the world. And we'll tell you why YouTube is the hot go-to place for podcasts uh, later on today as well. So I'm gonna uh, share uh, uh, the screen, which I am now, and turn the video off and we'll get started. All right, so again, thank you for joining us. And uh, we're just gonna take a look at the big picture. And uh, what you're looking here is the share of listening in Australia. Uh, and you can see it is dominated by live Australian radio at uh, just under 62.5%. So AM, FM, DAB, very strong, not going anywhere. Online listening uh, over the last few years, all around the world, whether you're talking Europe, America, or Australia, sits at around between 10 and 15 percent of listening and as you can see here we're looking at paid and ad supported streaming services taking around 15 percent uh, podcast in australia still very small there's a lot of hype everyone's talking about podcasting but we can still see that uh, it's still a very low 3.8 percent but growing and uh, yeah, also in there is your own CD collection, other audio, you've got uh, music channels on TV and audio books as such. But um, yeah, so we can see traditional radio listening still rules and streaming is, has been around that 10 to 15% for quite a while and continues to stay at that level. All right, I'll move on to uh, our next screen. And Danny, uh, okay. So what we're looking at here is, uh, again, music streaming. So we've looked at the big picture of how we listen to uh, audio. This is uh, that small part of music streaming. So we can see in Australia, uh, according to the Infinite Dial from 2019, which is a research study done by Edison Research, Commercial Radio Australia, Podcast One and Triton Digital, that Spotify is uh, the dominant player in the music streaming business. You can see it's been growing over the last three years. Apple Music is still uh, the second biggest and very much head to head with Spotify. And some of the new players, Google Play Music is, uh, had tremendous growth in that uh, last year. So to Amazon Music, we don't know, we don't really hear much about Amazon Music, uh, but it, it is growing in strength. SoundCloud is, uh, hitting there and then Tidal and Deezer. So they're the biggest music stream services uh, of this year in the last three years. So you can see uh, that I, I think it was Spotify in fact that um, has started to say that, well, radio is, is a market that we want to take on. And uh, they are now actually mimicking radio in some areas by doing sort of like uh, a very much mixed format, throwing in some podcasts and music and other bits and basically building a breakfast show, if you like, on Spotify. So, yeah, they want to take radio on, but they're also Im imitating radio at the same time. All right, so we're looking at radio streaming. So we've looked at the big streaming services with uh, Spotify and Apple Music. Now we're looking at radio aggregators. And these guys have hundreds, if not thousands, if not tens of thousands of radio stations on their platforms and you may you may already be on there if you haven't already signed up and registered for things like TuneIn radio it is really helpful to be found on these platforms because they are the defaults uh the default platform the default app for uh many speakers like google and alexa so when you say hey alexa play three triple r two triple r 
often it will default to tune in radio if there isn't another option. So if you want to be heard on a smart speaker in 2019, make sure you're registered on TuneIn Radio. At the moment, Community Radio is not on the radio app, but if we look at the stats here, iHeartRadio is the dominant streaming platform here in Australia. And uh, we'll talk about the partnership with Community Broadcasting Association, CBAA, and iHeart a little later. But um, that is a service where we're invited to join. Tune in, you can register, just hop on to tune in. Uh, the problems with some of these aggregators are you, you are a visitor on these platforms. So what you can access in terms of maybe promoting your station is limited. Accessing analytics um, is somewhat, uh, somewhat, somewhat limited. And updating details, particularly a bugbear on tune in, they really are not responsive in terms of updating um, your station information. Uh, when we registered uh, Hope 103.2 uh, a number of years ago, uh, we are still trying to update shows that are still being shown on TuneIn years after they're finished. So just be aware that they don't update their station contact details too often. And Radio App, the third most listened to radio streaming service in Australia. All right, now I'm bringing back this slide because I want to talk about podcasting. Uh, you may be podcasting a, a particular show or a specific program through your radio station, promoting it on air. Maybe you're a podcaster and you just want to get your podcast in more places. We can see uh, podcasting way big in America. It is reasonably small in Australia. It is growing but at the moment 3.8% of all audio and streaming listening. But uh, I want to talk about some of the platforms you can get on. So if you are a, a, a podcaster or you have podcasts that you're producing at your radio station, of course, Apple is king in terms of uh, podcasting. Really, it's the go-to place where you want to put your podcasts on uh, in terms of having a directory presence. Uh, yeah, it's a no-go. Uh, it, it's, it's, not, it's a no-brainer, what I'm trying to say. Definitely try Apple Podcasts. Now, the new player on the block is Spotify for podcasters. They've been beta testing this for uh, at least a year and a bit, but uh, in the recent uh, month or so, they have uh, opened it up and now you can submit your podcasts uh, on Spotify and we'll show a promo of that very soon. iHeartRadio, now you don't actually have to sign up through the CBAA to submit your podcasts on iHeartRadio. I think you just go to iHeartRadio.com.au forward slash submit submit podcast or something just google it and you can do that for free uh, i mean the reason being is they want as much great content on their platform as possible so and for you you want to get it out to as many new and existing listeners as possible pandora for podcasts is another new and growing podcast channel youtube and stitcher now if i can talk about youtube right now in terms of youtube uh, a lot of the large uh podcasters in the world are seeing YouTube as a really attractive platform for putting their podcasts. Not only can you put your transcripts up there so people can read it, but what it's good for is search. YouTube's search algorithm, it's owned by uh, Google, is very good at uncovering content. So uh, putting it up on uh, YouTube will, will expose it to a lot uh, more people and actually introduce your podcast to a lot of new audience, pe uh, audience members. Uh, you do have the potential to monetize that, and it is actually growing rapidly and uh, expected to grow rapidly in the coming years. Now, yep, it is a video-focused platform, but people are increasingly coming to YouTube to look for podcasts. What you can do is, if it's not a video podcast, it's just an audio podcast, you can put a still slide on there and put an, uh, an active wave uh, form on, on that video, which is just going up and down, creating a waveform. Uh, with you speaking. Uh, that's a simple way of putting a, a, a freeze frame, if you like, on your YouTube channel. Um, a recent survey of Canadian adults found that 43% of people went to YouTube for podcasts. It's almost half Canadian adults went to YouTube to find a podcast in the past year, which puts uh, YouTube ahead of Apple Podcasts at 34% in Canada, 23 for Spotify. Why don't we play the, uh, the latest ad for... Um, Spotify. I will try and play it.
not having much luck here. So we might give that a miss. But check it out. It's Spotify for podcasters. All right. Now we get to the meaty part of what are smart speakers? Well, pretty much they're a Bluetooth speaker and they have a voice uh, command device attached to it. Now, uh, if you're using a smart speaker, it's not going to work by itself. You actually have to download Amazon's Alexa or Google's uh, virtual assistant onto your mobile phone device so it can then hook up with the Bluetooth speaker and be somewhat intelligent. Um, and that's how it's going to work. So it's a speaker with a voice command device and it's got a, uh, an integrated virtual assistant attached to it. So like the Google virtual, uh, virtual assistant. Now, the way it works is uh, through uh, coding, uh, coders write what's called skills, and these skills are commands. So a smart speaker really isn't AI, it's not super intelligent, it's really uh, a list of codes and skills uh, which we tell it how to work. And one of the basic uh, commands is, hey Google, play 2 R on iHeartRadio. Oh, hey Google, play the latest podcast from NPR, All Things Considered. Now, if the skill has been written to understand those commands, it will play. Now, the idea is that as a radio station, you would tell your listeners what to say. And we'll see an example of Triple M doing that on their website. So on your website, it would be handy to have the commands that are required to find your station on Alexa and Google uh, Nest, as they are called now. So, uh, yeah, they're described as hot words, the words that activate these devices. Now, of course, there's uh, touch screens as well, and they're called smart displays, and you'll see them all uh, over the place this coming Christmas at uh, all the retailers. Um, and uh, these uh, touch they are touch screens now, they play videos, and are, are quite popular in the kitchen for doing recipes because obviously hands dirty, uh, making something, and it will walk you through creating that recipe that you're looking to do for, for dinner or for lunch. Quite a handy thing. So the stats in regards to smart speakers here in Australia are one in five Australians are owning smart speakers at the moment. Some of these uh, owners don't have one smart speaker in their home. They might have five in bedrooms, in living rooms, in kitchens, and all connected through their homes. Uh, we've seen rapid uh, uptake of smart speakers over the last two years, and it's uh, forecast to continue. We can see that Google and Amazon are the big players. Lenovo in smart displays is a, a, another popular player. But the likes of Sonos and Bose are also uh, using Google and Alexa as devices or as, as assistants on their devices. Uh, yeah, we're going to see a lot more growth in these markets. Uh, Edison Research, Triton Digital are saying that 2.7 uh, million Australians, 30% of Australians, own a smart speaker in 2019. And Australia, the Google Nest, which used to be called Google Home, is the major player in Australia. Now, the interesting thing is in America, it's the exact opposite. Amazon Alexa is the dominant voice smart speaker in America and Google is trailing. Um, personal experience, and I don't know about you, but I do find the Google uh, smart speaker experience to be a lot smoother and uh, the success rate for finding things that I'm after, including radio stations, a lot higher. I don't know what uh, your experience is, but um, Google, I guess, having been a search engine for well over 10 years, uh, has used all that uh, information gathering to create a very smooth experience with their smart speaker. All right, so uh, as I said, in Australia, you can see Google Home at around 80% of the market, Amazon Echo, a distant 7%, the Apple HomePod, 3%, and others, which would include Bose and Sonos, Lenovo at 11%. Now, if you're wondering, you know, what do Australians actually do with their smart speakers? The dominant thing that people do and use their smart speakers is for streaming music. And it's what we've talked about, streaming um, the Spotify's and the Apple Music's of the world, but also streaming radio through those aggregators like iHeartRadio and TuneIn and Commercial Radio Australia, and maybe one day Community Radio's app and uh, thing like that in the future. 
So yeah, listening to smart uh, to streaming music, weather forecasts, alarms and reminders, online searches, and coming in at number five is checking the news. But there's been a, uh, some recent activity actually around uh, news and getting news. And Google has created a new service which I believe in America, uh, organizations can actually submit their new service for inclusion in Google's smart speaker news. And it starts off with news bulletins. And as the, uh, the, the session goes, it progresses and gives you longer news stories, uh, you know, maybe 10 minute news stories, but it starts off with news stories that are a couple minutes long. So yeah, uh, and we'll find out very soon that alarm reminders, uh, what's happening is traditional radios are actually being replaced in households all around the world with smart speakers. So smart speakers replacing clock radios next to you in bed and in the kitchen, the radio being replaced by smart speakers or smart display speakers. So radio is still being heard and listened to in the household, but it's through a different device. And that's why getting smart skills and voice skills and, and, and getting control over voice search is really important in the years to come because also a younger generation is getting used to, um, the, the youth of today are getting used to searching things by voice. So what are the implications for radio stations in the years to come if today's youth are searching things through voice? It would assume, safely assume, that we need to be voice ready over the next five to 10 years. Alrighty, um, this is Google's product, which uh, is them talking about news. And all these videos were working and um, it would be lovely if it did work. So just bear with me and I'll try and get this video started. Uh, I can vouch for the fact that these were working when we were they testing were. them. Well, uh, what I might do, uh, Andrew, is I will make sure that we've got links to the videos in question that I will send out to all participants um, uh, tomorrow. If not, okay. earlier, I might try and uh, dig them up in the meantime. Apologies for that, everyone. Um, yeah. I'm sure we're very used to the fact that sometimes there's technical difficulties in community broadcasting, but we will get them to you eventually. I'll uh, we'll leave it back to you with Andrew. All right, so I uh, apologise for that. They, in our test run, they were working. All right, so in a typical week, do you ever use your smart speaker while? So these are how people are using their smart speakers. Doing household chores takes out number one spot. Cooking, as we were talking about. Um, a lot of people are starting to use their smart displays to create recipes in the kitchen while their hands are actually making uh, their food and their amazing uh, recipe. Uh, they're being guided quite slowly, step by step, through uh, with their smart speaker. Getting ready for the day. Now, um, you can set up on your smart speakers uh, a skill or a routine. And a routine is basically saying, okay, I'm going to say, good morning, Google. And when, I, when Google hears me say, good morning, Google, it will trigger off a series of, uh, of events that I've pre-selected that I want to hear when I wake up. So, for example, I might want to hear the news bulletin, the latest news bulletin when I wake up. Then the latest weather. I might want to hear about the latest business news from overnight. I might want to hear the traffic route and how busy that route is from my home to work. And then I might want to listen to a podcast. So when I say good morning, Google, it will trigger off all those uh, different events. Uh, pretty much like breakfast radio in, in many respects, isn't it? So it's just an example of how the smart speaker is mimicking radio in many respects and creating routines, which um, you know, more and more people are using and getting used to. We can see uh, that smart speakers are used for entertainment, browsing the web, working out, getting ready for bed and watching TV. Okay, so this is local information. The number of Australians who own a smart speaker, we can see the majority of smart speakers are owned by people in their 25 to 54 years of age bracket. And we can see that New South Wales and Victoria are leading the purchasing of smart speakers here in Australia. Queensland, Western Australia, South Australia, following with Tasmania at the rear. 
All right, this is an example of the growth and take up of smart speakers in America. I don't actually have these for Australia, but we can see that in December 2017, 66, it's basically almost doubled in that in that 12 month period to, uh, to December 18. And if we had 19 figures, we would see another dramatic increase as well. So what we can see is, and we can see it by the ads at JD Hi-Fi and Harvey Norman, and by the, the actual manufacturers themselves, they want us to use smart speakers. There is an adoption process taking place, a transition from traditional desktop computer searching to voice activated search. So yeah, as managers, as broadcasters, as program managers, we wanna be thinking about voice search and how our radio stations can be found through voice search. It's not gonna be easy, uh, but it's definitely something we need to start thinking about in the years to come or now. All right, Steve Ahern uh, did a great 30 minute video on the CBF YouTube channel. And if this video played, he would show you the challenges from May 2019 of using a smart speaker and trying to find your favorite community station to where we are now, there's been a dramatic difference. When uh, we had a session at the CBAA conference in uh, October down in Melbourne this year, I was able to say because of the partnership that we had uh, have with iHeartRadio and CBAA, the 30 stations thereabouts uh, that are on iHeartRadio now can be easily found through uh, the Google Nest smart speaker. And that's because iHeartRadio has an agreement with Google that iHeartRadio search results will be the default search result for Google Nest. So I don't need to say, hey Google, play Hope 1032 on iHeartRadio. All I have to say now is, hey Google, play Hope 1032. And by, to, by default, it will trigger that on Google. Um, back when this video was done in, in May 2019, it was a lot harder to get community radio working. The defaults, the most common default back in May, and if you're not on iHeartRadio, it's gonna be tune in radio. So that's why it's really important to register and make sure you're found on tune in radio, because again, tune in radio is gonna be the default on many other smart speakers. Okay, um, we'll send a link to Steve Hearn's talk. What he found was uh, some of the challenges facing community radio is uh, your brand. So in Australia, there are a number of stations with the same brand name. And at the moment, some smart speakers aren't intelligent enough to distinguish whether your station, Triple R, is in Melbourne or whether it's in Sydney. We've got three triple R in Melbourne, two triple R in Sydney. Um, it can stumble over that. Now, the great thing is when it's attached to apps, it can use the geolocation and know that you're in Sydney and it will play the Sydney two triple R. If you're in Melbourne, it will know that you're in Melbourne, it will play three triple R. So some of these things have been uh, ironed out, but it was a problem in May. The other thing is pronunciations. Four triple Z in Brisbane is a classic. It is very hard to get four triple Z on a smart speaker. You have to say four Z, Z, Z to be uh, recognized. So there's challenges with pronunciation and challenges with brand names and duplicate brands in Australia, but they are being overcome. So some thought having to be worked out on that. Um, and for the community radio sector, um, there will be more than likely some developments in this area happening in 2020, which will be quite exciting. All right, uh, again, another video I'll link to um, after this seminar, but it's uh, a guy whose surname is Holland. He is a quite a well-known radio consultant in the United States. And he was talking uh, about uh, radios, uh, I guess, re-emergence re in the house as a go-to device, but not as a traditional radio device, but in the form of a smart speaker. 
and uh, yeah, basically saying that radio is in a healthy position, but the radio devices we know it, I have known it, is 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 fading away in households. Alrighty. So. In the middle of this year, we launched a partnership with iHeartRadio. iHeartRadio, as we said at the beginning of the session, is, is the main radio aggregator here in Australia. It's run by the Australian uh, radio, network, uh, radio Network, ARN, here in Australia. And they extended an invitation to Community Radio to uh, come on board and join them. And there are a number of benefits of being on the iHeartRadio platform as a community station, which we'll talk about. Uh, the CBAAA launched with 16 stations. We've just got under uh, 30 now and had a great turn up at the conference uh, with a lot of people interested. And uh, we'll tell you how you can find out more information about iHeartRadio and how you can be part of it at the end of this session. All right. So what are the benefits for community radio joining up with a top aggregator like iHeartRadio in Australia? Well. What we're finding over the last five months, six months, has been that you can reach new listeners through the two million, over two million downloads of the iHeartRadio app here in Australia. So there are a lot of people using the iHeartRadio. It gets a lot of promotion. So you, you, you'll be exposed to new listeners, but it's also, if you don't have a mobile uh, device, a mobile app, it's a way of actually uh, telling your audience that wherever they are, when they leave, home or leave the car, they can still travel with you through the iHeartRadio app. So it's the fact that you can appear easily on streaming devices and be found everywhere. So if you don't have an app or you can't be found on the go, this is a great way to say on the radio, you can find us on our website, stream us on AM, or FM, on DAV, but also through the iHeartRadio app. Uh, that's, so that's reaching new and existing listeners. You'll get analytics each quarter. They are basic analytics, but enough to give you some progress reports. And that's one of the things with being on an aggregation app. Because we are guests and we're using a third party app, we don't have access to all their functionality. We don't have access to their dashboard or their admin area. So we get what an aggregator is prepared to give to us. But in iHeartRadio's uh, situation, they give us quarterly reports. They also have given us the option to actually communicate directly through in-app messages and through the message center of iHeartRadio to your listeners. So as you start on iHeartRadio and as more people listen to you, you'll have more people following you. Anyone that listens to you over a course of a period of time, you'll be able to send messages to them. So if you have a membership drive, a fundraising drive, maybe a major concert or an event, you can actually create the graphics. iHeartRadio will put it up and push it out to your listeners, which is a great thing. Uh, also, uh, and that, that acts as a pop-up. As soon as you open up the iHeartRadio app, it pops up with a message straight to your listeners. The other way is that there will be a cog wheel, an information message center when people log on to their uh, iHeartRadio app, and there'll be a message from you saying, hey, join us for membership drive next week where you can win this, 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 and this. Uh, or it could be a concert, whatever it is. Uh, one of the bonus things that we didn't actually know at the time was uh, that dynamic met metadata is included. So if you don't have a broadcast playout system uh, where all your music is stored digitally and as it plays, it sends out the song information, iHeartRadio actually identifies most of your mainstream music and will display the now song and now playing information on the iHeartRadio app, which is quite a cool feature. So it will tell you the, the uh, song title and the artist with an album cover as well. Another new thing is iHeartRadio, TuneIn and another aggregator have signed exclusive deals with Apple Music and HomePod to be found on their devices, which makes it uh, really good if you're on iHeart because you'll be found within the Apple ecosystem you'll be one of the default apps on their services. It's not open to everyone. Going in as an individual station, not really. We have the opportunity as community radio, perhaps that's something that we can negotiate as a community sector in the years to come. Now, if you're a radio station uh, tech or a manager, it's really helpful to display 
how listeners can find you on smart speakers. And that's what Triple M has done on this slide here. How to listen to Triple M on smart speakers. Of course, they've also got ways how you can find them on the live radio and also on catch up. They'll have uh, their MP3 and double uh, AC plus stream addresses if you want to put it in your hi-fi addresses. But down the bottom, how to listen, how to ask for Triple M on Google Assistant, on Amazon Alexa, because they're a network, they have multiple stations, and then they say, hey, Google, play Triple M, Coffs uh, Coast. And yeah, it's a great way, a no-brainer. If you can, get that on your website and help your listeners. Also say it on air when you're doing sweepers and stuff. You can say you can listen to us on iHeartRadio or you can listen to us on your Google smart speaker. Just say, hey, Google, play 88.9 Tamworth and it will find it on iHeartRadio. Okay, so this is just an example of what community radio looks like on the iHeartRadio mobile device. You've got your logo there. When there are song details playing, it will show the album covers and stuff like that. Uh, also, that's a desktop version. You'll just see that you've got your logo there. There's Facebook social integration and other bits and pieces. Okay, this is what I was talking about in terms of message center on the left. You can send a message to your audience, to your listeners. In FBI's case, it was sign up, become a radio supporter, and you can have a chance at winning tickets to Ritz Cinema, a year's worth of single O coffee, that would be awesome, and uh, etc. cetera. For Triple Z, that's an example of their message center message, but also their in-app message on the far right, which opens up as soon as you open the iHeart radio message. And it's a, again, a message saying, join us, become a member, this radio phone, with a call to action, the yellow button, subscribe now. These are really cool tools at the time, um, uh, you know, at first, you're going to have small numbers of listeners and maybe you'll only ever have small listeners, but it's good to be as different. It's good to be in as many different places as a radio station as you can. Your listeners are wanting to consume uh, your audio, your content on desktop, on the radio, on a TV, on a smartphone, on a smart speaker, on an app. If you can be everywhere, that's what you want to be. You want to be as in many different places so it's easy for your listeners to consume your content wherever they want to. Okay, so that's the in-app messages. Uh, this is just an example. Grace, uh, who's the station manager for Triple Z, for uh, Cap, Cap City radio station in Brisbane, but they don't have the resources, whether it's financial or manpower, to be able to tackle a, pro, uh, a project like a smart speaker uh, skill or an app. So partnering with iHeartRadio is a sensible, cost-effective way where they can find, be found by default on smart speakers and also have a, a roaming mobile to, uh, phone device. So yeah, that's Grace's experience. Well, I apologize for the videos. We can send links to those videos if you want to consume them, but thank you so much uh, for uh, joining us over the last 40 minutes. And if you've got any questions, I would be happy to take them. Uh, back to you, Dan. Thank you so much. Um, hopefully you're hearing me loud and clear. We've got a couple of questions that have come through via the Q&A. Um, everyone, you can feel free to use the question and answer box or just pop your questions there in the Zoom webinar chat. We'll try to get through to all of them. Uh, Craig Wright, g'day Craig, how are you going? Uh, can stations customise how they develop a trigger phrase, e.g. station nicknames that people can use for their smart speaker? Okay, so, yes, and that's one of the things, that's one of the ways that um, to have a successful smart speaker skill involves a lot of research, finding out all the different ways that your listeners refer to your radio station. So 3PS, 3PBS, PBS, PEEBS are just three different ways that listeners refer to Melbourne's 3PBS. Uh, aside from the brand name, so you want to gather as many different ways your listeners refer to your radio station. They can be written in the skills. Uh, so you appear on Google, Alexa, and so on. Going for, in terms of more skills, there are skills that you can do for podcasting. 
uh, for forwarding through maybe on-demand pre-recorded audio or rewinding uh, their extra skills. So you can actually be quite detailed and th there's lots of options in terms of writing skills. The challenge with skills is if you can't program yourself, it can be quite costly. Um, and maintaining those skills when uh, smart speakers are upgraded and ensuring that the skills that are, uh, have been written six months ago still work with the current upgrades. But yeah, you can uh, get as many station names as possible and yeah, add them to the skills. Excellent, thank you for that. Michael Keane, who falsely for some reason thought we were anti-Tasmanian, we're not. We're pro-Tassie, Michael. Um, hey, his question is, you mentioned using YouTube for podcasting. I assume this is for talk only podcasts due to copyright issues on YouTube. Yes, yes, definitely. I'm just talking about audio uh, talk only podcasts. I'm not talking about music. Uh, I mean, Danny, you know yourself in terms of music in podcasts. It's uh, it's a difficult area, uh, and I would stay away from podcasting music. Uh, yeah, I would not podcast music. Personally, uh, Danny, any, any extra to add to that? There is on the CBAA website, the uh, page, of course, the definitive Bible that we look to there in regards to um, sourcing your music legitimately that sort of talks about the terms of service for Spotify and YouTube and all of that stuff. So yeah, YouTube, it is one of those things, even though, as Andrew states, it is one of those platforms where a lot of people are consuming media, it is one that you've got to be very, very careful with. Yes, yeah, so yeah, my reference to YouTube is very much about talk-based podcasts and, and the podcasts that I would have been talking about, the Josh Rogan experience and stuff like that, are all talk-based. So yeah, not music-based podcasts at all. Excellent, I should point out to uh, Michael, sorry, Michael Keane, I got my Keane mixed up with my Keith Jones. Um, so hopefully we've answered your question and also hopefully I've clarified the fact that you weren't being anti-Tasmanian. Neither was we. Neither were we. Not no, at all. Is being, no one is being anti-Tasmanian. Um, now, uh, just wondering, so, so that's all the questions that are in the Q&A box there. Um, does anyone else have anything they would like to put in there? I have put the link into, I'll put it in there, the, another part of the chat box because... Um, so people know the iHeartRadio page on the CBAA website where people can go to to check out more. Um, I've noticed that a lot of stations have sort of uh, started utilising the iHeartRadio. Hopefully there's a few people there in the audience tonight who are there teetering on the brink and hopefully going to um, do their thing and get involved with that. Uh, sorry, Michael asks, do you have any starting tips for defining skills? I don't know if that's for me and my definition of who do I define, how do I define the attitudes of our uh, people here. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so, uh, sorry, the, that question, Andrew, any uh, starting tips? I'm not an expert with skill writing, um, so I can't really, I, I, I would be, uh, I can't really talk about the, the, the art of writing skills, but as I said before, you really want to do your research. Look at your Google Analytics to find out all the different ways people are searching for your radio station and ensure that whoever's doing the coding can include all those different, different uh, ways. Also pronunciations as well. As we said, 4 triple Z, how we say it, because Google and Amazon are American, it's 4ZZZ. So it's being aware of potential uh, pronunciations as well. Um, we can find out some more information about where you can go to find that and I'll pass that on to Danny and we can send that out um, in the coming days. Excellent. Bruce Lamb asks, can you give an idea of the cost of registering a station with iHeartRadio? Okay, so uh, the cost of uh, accessing iHeartRadio through the CBAA is $450. There's a setup fee and an annual maintenance fee. So what we've had to do to connect with uh, iHeartRadio is create uh, an a server that sits between your radio station and iHeartRadio. And that server takes your stream, does lots of different encoding that iHeart require, and then we ship it off to iHeartRadio for them to accept. So there's a bit of maintenance and server administration and development cost that's uh, involved. And that is why uh, there's a $450 
set up or set up and that for the first 12 months uh, maintenance fee included. And all those details are on the CBAA iHeartRadio page, which is cbaa.org.au forward slash iHeartRadio. And the question there in regards to that is, uh, what's the cost with TuneIn, do you know? Uh, TuneIn is free. The problem with TuneIn, um, it's, you should be on TuneIn. But the problem with TuneIn is they, as someone else has said, I won't put words in their mouth, but I'm pretty sure not, I know who said it, but is that they, they basically said they don't care about radio. And I guess my experience with being on TuneIn radio over the last five years is that we've still got presenters and old programs still showing up on TuneIn radio that have finished years ago. And we have no way of updating that content. And when we do put in submissions, nothing's done with it. So the danger is that your content won't be refreshed and updated. But I think you should still be on there because as we've mentioned, it's a default player for many devices. Um, the great thing about iHeartRadio is that we can update the details. We can give you the in-app messaging to your listeners um, and it is now default. So you don't have to say, okay, Google on TuneIn Radio or on iHeartRadio, play 2 R play Ultra 106.5. Uh, you just have to say, hey, Google, play radio station and we'll find it. And just to reiterate that, I was involved with the radio station that the TuneIn app was playing a different radio station for months despite uh, constant correspondence from the station to tune in to see if they could update it. So it's one of those things where it's... It's a great service, as Andrew says, very much worth your while getting on board, but also one of those things where I guess the fact that it's free means they don't feel that obligation um, to provide that customer service and it can be one of those things that are potentially damaging to your brand. Uh, Craig Wright asks, our station has been considering applying to join iHeartRadio as part of the CBAA partnership. However, we have a strong contingent of multicultural programs and some shows have connections via live streaming to their homelands. My understanding is that the iHeartRadio stream is geo-blocked. Have you encountered this issue uh, with other prospective stations wanting to take up iHeartRadio? And what strategies would you suggest? Worry about the cost of maintaining effectively two simultaneous streams. Um. I believe 4EB, 4EB in Brisbane is on. They're obviously a multicultural ethnic broadcaster. And uh, to answer the question in terms of geo-blocking, yeah, it's geo-blocked to Australia. Um, but yeah, there's not been, that's not been an issue with any of them that we uh, are currently hosting. So I guess that's just a decision that you would have to make yourself. Um, the cost, uh, at the moment, the cost to you is the cost of one single stream to iHeartRadio. Um, that's, that is the arrangement that we have at the moment. It's an on, it's, it's, it can change. If, uh, if our relationship became so popular that uh, iHeartRadio couldn't wear the cost, then it would change. But at the moment, it's a single stream cost to radio stations. You're only sending one stream to, uh, to, to us and then we send that on to iHeartRadio. Probably one of those things that's uh, worth sort of spending money on because you want to be on these platforms, you want to be where the listeners are, and obviously, like maintaining a radio station with the traditional FM broadcast can be a costly exercise. So probably looking at sort of the value that you get, the audience reach that you get via streaming, something to factor in there. I think um, if, yeah, if you can if you can afford four hundred and fifty dollars, uh, it's worth doing. Uh, you know, you, you've got some bonus uh, functionality which you won't get with TuneIn and other aggregation uh, apps. The fact that um, iHeart wants to promote your major events is a great bonus. You do get analytics as well. Um, uh, yeah, just just for the fact that you can message and communicate directly with your audience, not all the time, but for major events, is a great bonus. Uh, Richard Eddy asks, will iHeartRadio monetize my station if they place ads over our page on the app? Uh, well, they're an aggregator and they do make money from uh, video pre-rolls. There are no audio pre-rolls uh, before your station. They have a video pre-roll uh, and they only play that when you move to another channel. So um, your stream won't be interrupted. It's only when you go to another channel on iHeartRadio will it play a video ad. I hope that answers that question. 
Excellent. Uh, Honey, Benny asks, is the cost a month or annually? That cost is an annual cost. So you'll pay a one-off setup fee and then uh, a yearly fee of $150. Excellent. Thank you very much for that. I, I believe I might have come to the end of the questions. Uh, if anyone else has got any other questions, please let us know. Of course, you can always make contact with us here via email or on the phone or any other way that you might see fit. I'm pretty sure you can contact us via our Facebook if you're so inclined. Um, I've just put my email there. Oh, I've only sent it to Craig. I'm going to send it to everyone. Sorry about that, Craig. It looks like I'm <laughs> soliciting my email. And I know very well that you've got my email because we corresponded the other day. Um, yes, so the email is there. Any questions that you might have in regards to this that might sort of occur to you there in the middle of the night when you're tossing over in your mind, should you take this leap uh, into the digital future? You can let us know. You can get at us and have a chat with us uh, whenever you want because obviously sort of uh, iHeartRadio is something that we've thought long and hard about and we feel that it's a really excellent way for community broadcasters to continue to engage with their audiences. Um, this will be included in the follow-up correspondence that we'll send to stations, uh, but Andrew mentioned there before uh, a bit about podcasting. If you are thinking about podcasting, you might want to check out one of the CBAA webinars from earlier in the year, making a podcast from your program or a program from your podcast because, because of course, community broadcasters have everything there in place where if they did want to create content, uh, podcast content, they have the tools and they have the talent. And indeed, if they are already uh, creating podcasts, they might want to think, well, how can we use this content for our regular broadcast. Hopefully it is all there and part of that webinar. Um, yeah, I'm not seeing any more questions coming through, Andrew. So thank you, so Andrew, on behalf of the CBAA and the CMTA, thank you for taking your time this evening. I know you're a very, very busy man and it's very much appreciated that you take the time out here to address our audience as part of the last webinar for 2019. Really great to hit it up, finish it on a high note. Great, uh, well, th thanks, nice. thanks again. Yeah, and thanks for everyone uh, for joining us tonight. It's been great. Indeed. Thank you very much, uh, everyone who joined us. A uh, recording of uh, this evening's session will be available on the CBAA website as of tomorrow. I'd like to send a big special thank you to Hannah from the Community Media Training Organisation, who took, also took time out of her busy schedule to help us here uh, with this evening. Um, I will send through links to everything we've discussed as well as uh, links to the videos that totally work when we rehearsed this thing and then didn't work when it was crunch time. Why do you do this to me? Technical difficulties. Oh. But anyway, uh, the CBAA webinars will, of course, return in 2019. Be sure to check out the uh, website, cbaa.org.au slash webinars to find out more web services at cbaa.org.au if you want to get in touch with Andrew. Uh, any and all pages on the CBAA website will link to our e-news if you want to sign up for that. Uh, it would be wonderful to be able to discuss that with you. But Denny, Chifley, being me, on behalf of the CBAA and the CMTO and everyone else, thank you so much for joining us here for this evening's webinar. We'll talk to you in the meantime, but webinars will return in 2019.